We are both honored and properly humbled by Network's invitation to serve as host for Sister Simone, nuns on the bus, as they embark on a new and extended tour during which they will share their message of compassion, caring, and social transformation with audiences across the Midwest and the Mid-Atlantic. And I'd also like to welcome and to thank our many local co-sponsors for this kickoff event, organizations whose names you can see on the screen behind me. It is most gratifying to know that the work of Sister Simone and Network is supported by numerous concerned religious and citizen groups. We thank you all. Please join me now. So I'd like to join me now in the spirit of meditation and prayer. Thank you. What a treat to be back in Madison. And we were just saying, we were here uh, in 2014, and it was the end of October. And by this time of night, it was almost dark. And we didn't know what beauty you had all over there. Of course, I'd also say it's summertime and green, so we're really delighted. I would like at this point to invite my sisters from the bus to come forward and join me up here so we can see all the
Yes. Amen. That is what we're Here to wave goodbye to all the wonderful women are on the bus. Yeah, we're also not public speakers. So. 
Yes. <laughs>
Now, in it even been hard for me to ask that question because Margaret had always been fiercely private, even painfully private. But here she was. She knew that she was going to die. And at her most fragile moment, in her vulnerability, she had opened herself up to being seen, to being heard, and to being known. Imagine that gift that she gave. If there, if her illness and her story could be of some help to someone else in a future she herself wasn't banking on. Yeah, she was all in. When my family and I discovered that the first nuns on the bus tour would be in Cincinnati only two hours after Margaret's memorial service and only a mile from where she had lived, we decided that meeting these brave women would be our personal tribute to Margaret's memory. Here were religious sisters telling the truth on behalf of people much like our own sister, that access to affordable health care and the other fibers of the social safety net meet essential human needs. Though this is a political season, this is not about political ideology. It is a matter of life and death. How is it that members of Congress and states such as our own claim to be pro-life, yet refuse to expand Medicaid for all? Hear, hear. Is this done out of a willful ignorance of the consequences of their actions? Is this done out of a crisis of compassion where they cannot even acknowledge those still suffering? Or is it merely a political calculation done to pad their conservative credentials? We pray that legislators' minds be opened and their hearts be broken by the realities of life and death on the economic margins. You would think that even politicians could understand that adequate medical care saves lives. And it is a blessing. This woman comes up and puts her hand on my shoulder and she says, I'm Nancy. I'm one of Margaret's sisters. Oh my gosh. And I want to thank you for helping to heal our family. And she walked away. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I ran it after her and got her. And she said that my speaking of Margaret helped her feel less guilty, less upset, less worried. It gave meaning to an otherwise senseless death. Mm -hmm. And so when Lynn says, do our little part, what we never know is how, or rarely know, is how it ripples through all of society. And where does it go? Because I thank them for sharing Margaret with me. And they thank me for sharing Margaret with others. But thank you. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But what I've discovered on the bus is this instinct of thank you. Because people thank us for coming. I said, oh no, you do the hard work. Oh no, thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> and what I realized is that's community. Because when we see each other as gift, it's, it's the delight of our lives. Mm -hmm. And that's when we come together and weave something new. And isn't that what we hunger for in these very challenging times? Amen. Now, 
I think we have to kidnap them and bring uh, uh, Jeannie and Lynn on the bus because they yes. gave our speech so well. <laughs> You see on the pop-ups, we call these things pop-ups. You actually have to work to get them up. They don't know it's pop-ups. They're actually pop-downs. <laughs> but we have seven policies. And what we know is that policies got us into this mess we're in. Conscious choices. Now whether they knew all that they were doing or not, who knows? But conscious choices got us into this mess. And the good news, the good news is choices can get us out. Yes. That is the good news of our time. We can make change. But it's not going to come from our polarized politicians. It's going to come from us saying we can do this. And so, at Network, we pick seven policies. Now, people tell me, well, it doesn't include this, it doesn't include this, and it doesn't include something else. That's true. We're a small organization, so we have to limit ourselves. But what we know is that income and wealth and inequality are sucking the life out of our economy and out of our nation. Now, I want to tell you two stories. One is about Robin, who I met, and here's my trouble, is I've told Robin's story in and around this area, so if you've heard my story about Robin, just look interested. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Robin, I met, ironically, at the White House, and she was there for President Obama's signing of the uh, executive order to raise minimum wage for federal contract work. And she was there because a friend of hers was going to get a raise. And she was so excited. And she said to me, well, I'm not going to get a raise, but I know if my friend does, eventually I will too. And she was so excited to be in the White House, having grown up in Northern Virginia, had never been in the White House. And so she took a picture of the chair she was sitting in. <laughs> then she had me take a picture of her sitting in her chair. And then we got talking further. She had this beautiful blue dress, and it was from her shop. She worked for a national clothing store chain, full time, at minimum wage. And then she said, you know, by looking at me, you would never know I have to live in a homeless shop because I can't afford rent in this area. That is wrong in the richest nation on earth. Where we say, if you work hard, play by the rules, and you can support your families, this is no longer true. We have got to work for a living wage, not just minimum wage. And the living wage is enough wages so that, ooh, radical thought, maybe you could have a day off with your family <laughs> and not have to work a second or third job. Yes. yes. Too many families are desperate for time together. And on the bus in the fall, we were in Memphis, and this seven-year-old came, came to our town hall and we were asking questions about what are the divides, what are the divides in your city? The seven-year-old raised her hand. And so, of course, I had to give her the microphone and see what she had to say. And she said that parents have to work too many hours and they don't get to spend time with their kids. Wow. And I said, well, how did, how did she know that? That's pretty astute for a seven-year-old. My mommy has to work nights and I don't see her then. And my daddy works the days and I don't see him in the morning. What a time. What a time. But that goes with Jason, who I met in La Jolla, who's one of the top 1%. Jason, 
told me that he was getting upset because his tax dollars were going to fund his competitors. Your tax dollars are going to fund your competitors? I don't get it. How's that? What he said was he pays all of his employees a living wage, but his competitors don't. So his competitors have their employees use the social safety net in order to survive. Mm -hmm. Jason knows he's in favor of his tax dollars going to create a social safety net. But they're no longer just for people who've fallen on hard times. They're now a business subsidy. Mm -hmm. And we the people have to make that clear. That is not what they were intended for. And so Jason, while he's perfectly happy and delighted to pay a living wage, doesn't want his tax dollars funding his competitors who can underbid him. Mm -hmm. We've got trouble. Mm -hmm. And then I was in Lubbock, Texas. I was telling a couple of you the story. In Lubbock, Texas, talking about this problem, so lifting up these issues, and their kids at the Texas Tech University said, Ooh, but having higher wages, isn't that going to hurt the economy? <laughs> and I realize we've taught our young people to worry more about the economy than they do about our people. Because our people are suffering now. And this is why I love it that Pope Francis is on our side. <laughs> The economy should serve the people, yes. not people serving the economy. Right. And that's the cultural change that we need to be about. Mm -hmm. That is the huge challenge for us. And then in order to do that, that means we need to get health care for all. It means we need to access to voting. It means we need to make sure that everyone has a safe place to live, affordable place to live. What an idea. And then we have to make sure that our immigration system is fixed so we're no longer exploiting those who are at the margins. Amen. We've got our work ahead of us. So now I hope you all got, did you get your new car? Does anybody have a car? Yeah, yeah. No. Yes. Okay, my sisters have that we call them swag bags to pass out cards. You don't have them. But on one side, it says nuns on the bus, and you get our seven right. our policy pieces. Okay, raise your hand up at the top. It seems like up at the top of some books. Okay, this is the first time we've done this, so this is kind of fun to figure out how it's going to work. I hate to call you guinea pigs as you were this in. Okay, then we need some people up. Uh, there are folks who are running downstairs. I see them coming. Okay, <coughs> yeah, looks coming fabulous. Okay, maybe while we're getting that, some people really like texting. Okay, but how many that it's impossible? So don't go to your family members, but you take my family, and I'll take yours. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll make progress together, okay? <laughs> and then finally, we haven't asked this, oh, not finally, next to us. Um, if you feel inclined to help fuel the bus, we would also be grateful for that. And you can just hand any contributions to our sisters or go online at nunsonthebus.org and help us out because I will confess we haven't raised all our money yet so we hope we don't run out someplace <laughs> at New Hampshire or something. It could be a long winter but we're trusting in the Lord. And finally we have two additional pieces. One is what we call side by side where your Senate candidates stand on our seven issues. 
with a piece of data about the reality in Wisconsin. And then we also have it for the presidential candidates. Some people told me that was mildly amusing. <laughs> it's very important. Okay, so you can pick those up outside. The other thing is to let me know that if you want to share these with friends, feel free to take extra, take them with you, take them home, send back the cards, but share the side by side so the stories get told. Okay? Now, to close my part is to say that we're going on the road and we're asking your prayer for support. But I want you to know that we carry you with us. Partially because you'll sign the bus. But the other part of it is because you're the reason we're on the road. You're the reason that it's worth doing this. You're the reason that we can bring a little bit of joy and mischief making to various parts of our country. But what we know is it's seed planting. I often feel like Johnny Appleseed. Mm -hmm. And you plant a seed in us, and we plant a seed in you, and all of a sudden that orchard can grow. It takes time, but it's possible. And eventually, it does bear fruit. It is the fruit that is delicious and special, because it's the fruit that's called community. For we know we're in this together, no one is left alone, and we the people can make it. Thank you. Thank you. Prayer to Daily Life. She writes, A prayer for the journey. We could say it every day. When we first leave the soft warmth of our beds and don't know for sure if we'll return at night. When we get in trains and planes and automobiles and buses. And put our lives in the hands of strangers. Or when we leave our home for a day, a week, a month or more, will we return to a peaceful home, untouched by fire, flood, or crime? How will our travels change us? What gives us the courage to go through that door? In light of the violence of last week and in light of the racist criminal justice system that ravages black communities and is killing innocent black folks throughout the country, I ask I keep asking, what gives my black brothers and sisters the courage to go through their doors? What gives the parents of African American sons the courage to send them through their front doors each morning? So I translated the words of Rabbi Weinberg for the families of Philando Castillo in Minnesota and Anton Sterling of Baton Rouge and Jay Anderson in Milwaukee and all the other black families who travel in our racist society. A prayer for their journey. We could say it every day when we first leave the soft warmth of our beds and don't know if we'll return at night, when we get in automobiles and don't know if we'll get stopped by the police and return home alive. Will we return home untouched by trauma and violence? How will our travels change us? And what gives us the courage to go through the door? May our prayers tonight the journey of these nuns on the bus, and our work together bring healing to the families of people killed by police violence and the families of the officers killed last week in the line of duty. And may our prayers bring courage to fight the violence and racism that is tearing apart this country. May the journey of these sisters bring light and humanity into the dark places and bring voice to those who are voiceless and comfort to those who are suffering. We pray together for Sister Simone, Bernadine, Alaria, Susan, Julie, Claire, Margaret, Lorette, and Erin, and all who will join them on their journey on the bus. May it be your will, shelter and honor God, God of our ancestors, that you lead them on the road of peace and protect their footsteps and enable them to reach their destination alive and well, happy and safe. Protect them from all harm and mishap on the road, and grant us favor and kindness and compassion. 
And may your own eyes and the eyes of all who may behold them. And may you hear our communal voice in prayer. And let us say, Amen. Amen. My name is Stephen Marsh. I'm a co-pastor at Lakehead Lutheran Church. And I have been asked to give a Christian blessing to our sisters as they go. And so, may the God, who is both our Father and our Mother, the God who sent both Jesus and justice into our midst, the God who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ever even ask for or imagine. May that God, the God of the church, the God who will be with you on the journey, through the highways and the byways, at the rallies, in the protests, through the tears, through the struggles, and at the eventual tables of reconciliation, victory, and peace. May that God bless you on your journey. In the name of Jesus and forever. <laughs>